right, everybody, welcome to Studio B. I am your host, Pastor MDH. Thank you so very much for joining us again on the set. We greatly appreciate you tuning in every single week and every time an episode drops uh, for your viewership and for your support. Today, today, um, let me just ask you a question, man. Uh, What in the world is going on? Uh, I want to speak from uh, a very uh, sensitive spot for me, and that is as a father. First, we got several stuff that we're going to talk about today, but uh, let me just kind of get this off my chest if I can. Um, I, one of the mainstays of my life is being a father. It is terribly important to me. If I can get two things said of me when I breathe my last on this side, it will be one, that he loved God with all of his heart, and two, that he loved his family. I believe if I can get those two things said about me, I've lived a productive life on this side. Being a father is one of my greatest privileges afforded to me by God. It is an important role by which I take very, very seriously. I will not lay down my family on the altar of anything. Um, There's God first and then my family and everything else is a distant second, a distant third. Um, family is very, very important to me. And and I, I, I come to that particular place um, because it's important for me because of how I grew up and what I didn't have as a family. I had people around me that loved me. I had people around me that cared for me. Um, but I miss certain aspects that if I would have had them, I believe I could have avoided a lot of the pitfalls that I eventually fell into. So family is very, very important to me. I have four children, um, three girls and a boy. I just releasing, uh, recently just dropped my only son, my one and only son off to college. And uh, so we got three kids in college right now, one still at the house. And as we were on our way back from dropping our son off at college, my wife and I were discussing um, the value of family. And I told her, I said, uh, I believe that God is pleased with what we have presented back to him. Not that we have been perfect, but we have provided structure, um, firm foundations. And what I've tried to do um, to the best of my ability is take away any and every excuse for not succeeding in life. Um, It's very, very important for me to tear down walls and to build my children up so that they can go to be um, the people that God has called for them to be. But as we were driving home, I asked her, I said, what type of world are we leaving our children? Like, I'm on the other side, man. If, if I take Psalm 90 at face value, I know it's a principle more than it is a promise. But if I take it as face value that we are promised three score and 10 years, that's 70 years. If I take that at face value, I'm 48 years old, so that means I got 22 years of more living. Now again, that's that's a principle, not a promise. But if I take that at face value, I got 22 more years. As I look at my kids, um, 21 and under, what type of world am I leaving them? How am I preparing them for this world that they will have to navigate uh, in and through. And if you don't know, the world is drastically changing and it's changing right here in front of our eyes. And I think about this a lot, man. I'm I'm out of the me moment. Um, Marcus Holman has lived a full life. God has been tremendously kind to me. Uh, I have achieved many milestones in my life. Uh, I am good. Uh, I believe that I have done some things that uh, in my in my younger years, in my youth that I would have never imagined doing. I'm good. My wife is good. But I'm asking about our children and and what type of world are they going to inherit, Um, especially and I speak in regards to um, this this life that we're currently in. Because every time I turn around, there's something else going on. Something um, 
that is seemingly out of our control, but yet in our control. That if we did certain things differently, the things in which we're dealing with now, we wouldn't have to deal with at the scale that we are dealing with them. Um, please don't get it twisted. Life is a cause and effect. Um, life is about decisions and or consequences. And so as I look at my children and as they are begin to navigate through life to get their own footing and to do certain things, I say, man, what type of life am I giving them? And it's a very real question. I have told my children, and this is just the fabric of the Holman house, is that because of what God has done, um, because of how you've been raised, there is a standard that you have to rate, that you have to reach for. Um, there is a calling. There is a a bar that has to be reached. Um, you are expected to do more because you have more, and to whom much is given, much is therefore required. And so, when I look at my children, I ask them. <clears throat> What do you want to do in life? Um, what do you want to accomplish? What have you seen these last 19, 20, 21 years of your life? How do you want to make this world better? How can you <clears throat> empower people? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> empower people. How can you encourage them? How can you help people to achieve what they don't even themselves believe that they can? How can you do that? Well, one of the ways that you can do that is by believing that you can do it. And so I have tried painstakingly to remove any excuses out of my children's lives. And so what I've tried to do as their father is stretched beyond my capability to reach and get things that require work so that they see from beginning to end. And when they see the realization of that coming to pass, they are encouraged that if my father can do it, because I've personally seen my father do something like this, my mother do something like this, then I myself can do it. And so I've tried to instill in them that you are responsible for your own destiny. You are. But I'm concerned as a father about the world that I'm, that my children are inheriting. As I stand to you on this day, there's no shortage of world headlines, not just national headlines, but world headlines. And what we need to understand in America is that when America coughs, everybody else gets a cold. Um, <clears throat> America is a superpower. And what happens in this nation reverberates around the entire world. Make no mistake about it. What happens in some of these smaller countries stays within their country. But what happens in America absolutely resounds around the entire world because America is a superpower by which many of the countries and nations depend on. And as you look at the news uh, on your news cycle, whoever you may listen to, wherever you may gather your news from, uh, we're reading the same headlines, but I've always encouraged you to go behind the headline and to research the issues for yourself. Don't be a person that is moved right or left by the headline. The headline is just the headline. Go behind the headline so that you understand what's going on and how and if it affects you in your everyday life. That's what needs to be done. 
the unfortunate part about, and it is an unfortunate part about the early 2000s, maybe 2000 or 2001, when social media and the like began to become a fabric of our everyday existence. And now over 85% of all people in America get their news and information from social media sites where we're no longer relying on the papers where we have to read, where we have to gather information. Information is now just readily available at a click uh, of a keypad. Uh, that's good for convenience, but it's bad for research um, because there's so many different sources out there and many of them not credible uh, to lend the information that they're giving. And so it has to be a very methodical approach about weeding through all of this garbage in order to get to the truth of what you're trying to research. And that is a painstaking process. But in our world today, we are again bombarded by world headlines. And again, world headlines. And these world headlines will affect um, the average everyday person in America, even though you don't think that it does, it will. Uh, and let me start off with this. Um, and today's show is just going to be talking about five of these headlines. And, and I'm not going to lend a lot of attention to it, but I do need to try to talk to them from a very um, practical place and, and, and try to get us to understand, not try to get us to understand, but maybe shed a little bit of light about how this will eventually affect us because it will. Um, Studio B takes all of the stuff that you see on TV, that you see on the social media sites. We talk about those things and then we cross a bridge and ask, what does God say about that particular issue? So it's not just talking about them for the sake of talking about them, but really talking about them from a place of grassroots solutions and practical application. What has been dominating the news source for the last two weeks, uh, three weeks actually, but especially in the last two is the debacle in Afghanistan. Um, as you know, America is withdrawing all of its troops, air support, uh, intelligence support um, out of the region of, uh, of Afghanistan. And there's a lot that has been going on. Um, we're coming up on three, in about three weeks, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. In about three weeks, September the 11th, will be 20 years since 9-11 happened. Uh, we're going to do a special show on that day to commemorate that day. But if I say 9-11, everybody watching remembers where they were and remembers what they were doing um, when the first plane crashed into the Twin Towers. You remember that day. It is permanently embedded into your memory because it was such a traumatic day in American history and it literally changed the landscape of America. So in about three weeks, we're coming up on the anniversary of that particular day where 3,000 plus Americans were killed in a terrorist attack um, and the Pentagon was, um, was attacked and all of these different things began to start to unfold. We got into the war in Iraq and then Afghanistan and all of these things begin to snowball. We're coming up on three weeks to the 20th anniversary of that. And the group that was most responsible for the 9-11 attacks, the Taliban, um, which was headed by Osama bin Laden, uh, that was killed uh, under the leadership of President Barack Obama, that group that was most closely associated with the planning and the implementation of that, of that set of attack has now retaken control of Afghanistan. And they did it, they've taken over right now, as it stands today, 28 of the 34 cities in Afghanistan. 28 of the 34 cities are now under Taliban control in Afghanistan. And they did that in a matter of 10 days. Completely retook the country. Uh, when America pulled out and is pulling out of Afghanistan, we are not taking the Black Hawk helicopters. We're not taking the guns. We're not taking the, um, the the military fortresses that we were occupying. All of those things are actually staying on the ground 
uh, in Afghanistan. The president of Afghanistan, President Ghani, um, recently withdrew and um, ran for his life uh, to get out of Afghanistan and declaring victory for the insurgents over the last 20 year war. Approximately 55,000 Afghan troops since 2015 have lost their life in defending or trying to defend uh, Afghanistan from the Taliban just since 2015. Uh, Afghanistan is a mess. It, it is an absolute mess. Uh, recent reports, and you'll see this, this particular clip floating around YouTube and any other place you want to find it, where um, the American forces were removing the embassy workers and American civilians out of Afghanistan and where the Afghan people were climbing on top of these air, uh, airplanes as they were departing, holding on to the wheels and grabbing on to the wings of the plane. There's video where people are falling out of the sky as they were holding on to the planes leaving Afghanistan. The desperation of the Afghan people of risking life and limb holding on to the wings of an airplane as it is taking off to try to get away from Afghanistan. And this particular plane was headed to the United States. They were willing to risk life and limb to leave Afghanistan and get to the US. Afghanistan is an absolute mess. It is an absolute disaster. And there are calls for resignations on every different front um, because of the, the fallout of this absolute debacle. What does this mean? What does this mean? This stronghold, and the Taliban was not 100% responsible for the September the 11th uh, terrorist attacks on U.S. soil, but they were directly involved uh, with these planning and implementation of the attacks on uh, the United States of America. And now they have regained a foothold and they have been weaponized. They have been strategically placed. And now the very region that we ran them out of, destroyed the caliphate, destroyed major operations, have been rebuilt and the stronghold has now been regained. What does that mean? Um, not to put anybody on fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear. But if we have allowed them to regain the strongholds, it is important that now we be on our guards because Afghanistan will be ground zero for a lot of different things that are happening around the world. Of all of these Afghan refugees that are coming out of Afghanistan, 2,000 were shipped to Uganda just yesterday. 2,000 Afghan re uh, refugees were shipped to uh, Uganda. 3,500 were shipped to Kenya. 1,500 were shipped to Tanzania. They're being dropped off all around the nations of Africa. Just here, there, and everywhere. Planes are landing on the tarmac, and thousands upon thousands of Afghan refugees are being unloaded in various spots all around the world with this UN resolution. It is a mess. Um, and it is something that we need to be paying attention to because what you see going on right now in Afghanistan uh, will reverberate here in the United States of America. Now, one of the great things about uh, America is that America is resilient, it is robust, um, it is full of people that have been down and have fought their way back up. America, uh, in all of its essence, um, will be able to withstand whatever is the fallout of this. However, there are things that we need to understand about this role and what is going on in, in this region. Um, as I looked at all of these videos and as I looked at um, the melee that is going on in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the things that is flying under the radar is Afghanistan has the second largest 
underground church in the entire world. Only that to China. Afghanistan has the second largest underground church in all of the world. Second only to China. Since January of this year, over 300 pastors in these underground churches have been murdered, directly targeted by the Taliban. Because the principles by which they preach in Christianity are diametrically opposed to that which they teach in the Taliban. You're about to see in Afghanistan um, atrocities that you have never seen before. Uh, when you're talking about the treatment of women, uh, when you're talking about the treatment of minorities, uh, when you're talking about the treatment of those who do not conform to their way, uh, the Taliban does not respond with, let's talk about it, let's get your perspective. Um, they talk about it and they deal with it with force. They deal with it with force. Over 300 underground pastors in Afghanistan have been killed, murdered since January of this year. Not a blip on anybody's radar. No news has been made of it that these particular pastors are being targeted and religious persecution is being done at the hilt at the highest level. Not a blip on your radar, not a blip on your social media. These pastors um, will be targeted even more now that America has now pulled out of the region. Uh, there is no protection. It is a Taliban rule now. Um, Sharia law will be that of the land. And I don't have time to go into Sharia law. Uh, look at it for yourself. It will be the lay of the land. Um, the U.S. before it left and before it was pulling all of its citizens and embassy workers out, um, tried to make a plea with the Taliban leadership and ask them to include women and minorities into their leadership ability, into their leadership capacities. That's absolutely laughable. It's absolutely laughable. Taliban does not believe in that. There will not be any women in leadership. There will not be uh, any minorities in leadership at all. Zero, period. End of discussion. Uh, my fear is, is that the religious persecution the persecution of minorities and those that do not fit the role of uh, the Taliban will exponentially be increased um, in the days, months, and years to come. It will become a hotbed of persecution. Um, I'm not a prophet, nor do I ever claim to be one, but it will become a hotbed of religious and otherwise persecution. And it is par for the course. Um, this is this is what happens um, when America does certain things. So I would ask that you would be really praying um, for the people of Afghanistan because it's going to be a long haul. If you guys remember Libya, <clears throat> if you're old enough to remember Libya, when Gaddafi was assassinated and taken out of power, in the name of democracy. When Gaddafi was taken out of power, Libya turned into a vacuum, into a failed state. Libya is now the number one place in the world for terrorist organizations, recruiting. It is the number one place in the world that women are persecuted, killed, maimed, raped, in Libya, it is a failed state. You don't see this stuff being plastered all over the news. You don't see it um, because it doesn't fit a narrative. I would ask that you would be praying, um, those of us who, who believe in the power of prayer, and, and really be calling uh, these particular countries out by name uh, because everybody... This stuff does matter. Um, this is not politics. This is not um, red or blue. This is not partisan stuff. These are people's lives. 
and this stuff matters. Okay. And so be praying for Afghanistan as the road has just began. And uh, I'm usually a pretty optimistic person, um, but I'm a very uh, I'm, I'm pessimistic in this regard to what the future looks like in Afghanistan. China is trying to make inroads into this huge vacuum that is Afghanistan um, by promising support uh, to the Afghan government. <laughs> While at the same time trying to take over Taiwan uh, because it's creating a vacuum that somebody, uh, some power has to, um, has to fill. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Interestingly enough, the Taliban leadership has an active account on Twitter. You've heard me, right? If you go to Twitter right now, you can find active Taliban leadership tweeting about the Taliban on Twitter on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, active. Most recently one I saw was just this morning. And I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to give them any pub. You'll have to go and search it for yourself. Active Taliban leadership have active profiles on social media where they are recruiting and propagating uh, Taliban uh, beliefs where they are actively pursuing and talking about violence and yet they have active social media accounts yeah at any given time Throughout the 24-hour day, uh, there are at least 1.4 billion people on the planet that access social media. The Taliban has an active social media account, but the president, the former president of the United States, has been banned from all social media accounts forever. That's what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, down to the south, east of where I am in Houston right now, there's this little Caribbean island called Haiti. Um, Haiti is very dear to, to me and to us, as I have personally been to that particular country 22 times uh, in the last nine years, last 10 years, excuse me. Um, of course, we know about the assassination of their president, Jovenel Moise, um, as they begin to transition out of that. And, and the 26 people that were involved, 28, including the people that were in Miami that were involved um, directly and indirectly with the assassination of their president and how the country was reeling and in protest and in uproar because of that. Um, gangs have been taking a top tier, have been taking over communities um, for not just now, but over the last few years, um, especially. Uh, they recently now just got hit again uh, with a 7.2 earthquake last Saturday in the region of Port-au-Prince. Uh, recent estimates, as I stand before you right now, is some 500 people have been confirmed dead and some 3,000 people are still confirmed missing. Um, it, it seems, and, and I've thought a lot about this, what's going on in Haiti, and Haiti especially. Um, Haiti seemed to just can't get a break, man. They, they just seem to not be able to get a break. It's, it's literally one thing after another. And, and being on the ground in Haiti so many times, I can personally attest not because of what somebody told me, not because of what I've seen on TV, but I can personally attest 
to some of the melee that is going on in that region. I have witnessed it firsthand. Uh, I have been in that region numerous times. I have ministry partners from Port-au-Prince to Grand Guave to Cap Haitian to uh, to to Bud Bouye to uh, to Jeremy all around the nation of Haiti. Uh, I've got ministry partners and connections all around. So I, I am very well versed in those particular regions. And I know that what's going on is real. And I am not talking about getting on a plane and traveling 24 hours across the Atlantic to Africa. I'm talking about going from Houston to Miami and from Miami to Haiti. I'm talking a two hour flight. Okay, right here in our backyard, Haiti is a country that is reeling. It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. 60% of all Haitian uh, citizens live on less than $2 a day, and it's less than two hours away from us. Uh, we often say that you can go to Africa just by going to Haiti, um, because Haiti just continues to reel out of control. There is no stability in the region. And the amazing part about Haiti is that Haiti is a democracy. Haiti actually elects its leaders. It's not a socialist country. It's not a communist country. They don't just put people in office and those people stay in office for decades and decades and decades and decades. No, it's a democracy to where they go to the polls and actually uh, elect their leaders. It's a democracy. And it's crazy when you begin to start looking at Haiti and why Haiti has such a difficult time getting up on its feet, that it's been years and even centuries that Haiti has been in the predicament that it is. And if you know anything about history, Haiti is the first African country to declare its independence in 1804 when it's won its independence from France. It is the first African country that raised itself up against the oppressors of its time and won its independence by violence. Uh, they took up arms and ran the people out of their country and declared their freedom. This is the first African nation to ever do so. Haiti was once a prosperous nation with rice and sugarcane uh, farms. But there is a history behind Haiti that you just simply can't wrap your arms around about why this nation cannot seemingly get a break. Uh, you guys know in 2010, when the earthquake first hit uh, Haiti, where 300,000 people uh, lost their lives and over 100,000 people were confirmed missing. Now, that was that's that's almost half a million people in 2010 that were either directly affected or displaced by the earthquake of that time had dramatic impact and watch this even in 2011 you can ride through port-au-prince and there are still collapsed buildings not from the earthquake that just happened last week there are still collapsed buildings from 2010 in haiti right now um and, and as I think about this man and I, I, th I think about the people that I know in Haiti, um, I'm often driven in prayer to God about why can't Haiti catch a break? Um, you, you're just getting back or you're trying to put together some semblance of a government trying to get back some order after your president was assassinated in his own home. Your president who has a presidential detail, got assassinated, shot 12 times in his head. His wife got shot three times in his personal home that got past his presidential security guard and none of them got shot. None of his presidential detail, none of the police that were guarding his home, none of them sustained any wounds, any injuries at all but yet they were able to gain access into his house and shoot him 12 times in the head. It, it, it begs to the point of what's going on in Haiti. What's going on in this international community 
that has poverty off the charts. What's going on in this region that they can't seemingly get a break? It is, it is terribly perplexing. Um, as somebody that has been there a number of times, I can tell you, even from my own experience, it's almost like spitting into the ocean. Uh, as we go down and we take all of this stuff and we do all of this stuff, we do, you know, leadership development, we do business, micro and macro financing, we we build ministries, we, we lift up people in the region, and it seems as though you're kind of spitting in the wind um, because the problem is so massive. But this nation is so small, but the problem is so massive, and it's literally two hours away from us. Another devastating blow for Haiti. Uh, 7.2 earthquake that rocked that nation that caused buildings to crumble. And when you go to Haiti, everything is made out of concrete. Everything. Wood is too expensive. So the homes there are made out of concrete. So it's not that you have a house that's made with two by fours and four by fours with a frame. These are concrete houses on stilts. So as it collapsed, concrete boulders are falling to the ground. And, and this is happening again in this region of Haiti. And so it, it begs our prayers. Um, it begs our support. Uh, and I just want to say this, please, as you are looking for people uh, as you're looking to support that region, either by prayers or by financial support, I want to just put this in here from my heart. I want to I want to really make sure that you understand this. Please make sure that you vet any and everybody that is supposedly gathering support for that region, um, because I personally know that a lot of the support that people are doing never gets to the places where they say they are supporting. Um, when the 2010 earthquake happened and Two billion dollars, no, excuse me, twelve billion dollars got collected from all of these major stars when we were doing earthquake, Haiti earthquake relief, and they were doing, you know, concerts over here, and all of the proceeds go to Haiti. Twelve billion dollars was raised. Twelve billion. Less than two percent of that actually got on the ground. That $12 billion goes from World Bank to World Bank to World Bank to World Bank. When World one, when, when one World Bank gathered it into their accounts, they gain the interest off of it. It goes to another. It's being floated around so that people in very high places get paid off of that stuff. That money is not reaching the regions. I can promise you this. The last time I've been to Haiti, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to go there since 2018. I can tell you in the places that I've gone to, uh, all around Haiti, um, that $12 billion ain't even touched the surfaces of Haiti. So please make sure that you vet uh, very, very carefully those who are talking about we're, we're, we're gathering support for the people of Haiti. Uh, so please keep uh, Haiti in your prayers because it needs it. Um, I don't know when we're going to actually be able to get back over to Haiti. I really, I really don't know. Um, the crazy part about Haiti is that it literally borders Dominican Republic. Like literally you can walk across the street and be into the DR. Like literally. The Dominican Republic and Haiti literally are separated by like a peninsula. You can walk across it the same way you can do it in Kenya and Tanzania by just simply walking over a line and you be from Kenya to Tanzania. You can do the same thing in Haiti and Dominican Republic. Now, you know that Haitians and Dominican Republic um, and, 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 and um, they don't get along. Right. And you often hear about when people go on a vacation, they go vacation where? To Puerto Plata. They go to Santo Domingo. They go to the Dominican Republic. But you never hear about anybody going to vacation in Haiti. And they're literally right next door. They're lit literally, not figuratively, right next door. Dominican Republic and Haiti are two different worlds. Two different worlds. 
the beauty and the pristine that you see in the DR. Now the DR does have some poor places as it does in Haiti, but the DR in Haiti are diametrically opposed. They are the, the A and B side. They are night and day, but yet they're back door to each other. It's an amazing dichotomy when you, when you look at those two nations that are back door to each other but yet they are completely opposite in the landscape of those nations. What affects Haiti does not affect the DR. Does not. It does not affect the DR. As a matter of fact, the DR closed its borders when the president of Haiti got assassinated. When Haiti was in an uproar and people were fleeing the country for political asylum, and because the gangs were gathering steam and gathering power and people were trying to get out of Haiti, the Dominican Republic, which is right next door, closed its borders to the citizens of Haiti, uh, to Haiti. I don't know why Haiti can't get up on its feet. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm taken aback. Uh, I've thought about it. I've talked to the people in the region. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I do know this, that France uh, and America played a vital role in the crippling of the Haitian economy. Um, history is replete of that. Matter of fact, Haiti just finished paying back, hear this, reparations to France. Uh, they just finished up their last payment in 2017 to where they've paid France billions of dollars in reparations. Now there is this UN resolution trying to get France to pay back that money to Haiti, especially with all of the melee, uh, melee that is going on, which I do not believe will happen. France has paid a particular role in the crippling of the Haitian economy and has America. America outsourced one of Haiti's most valuable um, resources, which was rice. So 70%, 70 to 75% of all of the rice that comes into Haiti, watch where it comes from. It comes from this little place called Arkansas. 70 to 75% of all the rice that comes into Haiti comes from Arkansas. Because America in 1995, excuse me, 1996, crippled the rice industry in Haiti where rice was one time a delicacy, um, uh, something that was um, uh, not par for the course, but a delicacy in the Haitian economy um, for years upon years, when it started coming in from the West and the West started flooding the Haitian economy with rice, now every day, all day, they eat rice in Haiti. Rice is a mainstay of the Haitian food. It's rice every day. Rice with vegetables, rice with gravy, rice with this, rice with that, rice with this. It's rice, 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 rice. All day. Because it's no longer a valuable commodity because the market has been saturated with it. Which crippled the rice farmers um, in Haiti. So please be praying about Haiti and, and be praying uh, and really praying for it, everybody, because there's some wonderful people in Haiti. Um, there's some, and I know Haiti got some issues with, you know, voodoo and all that other stuff, but so does America. Um, I, I know that Haiti has some irreligious practices, but so does America. So does every other nation uh, on the face of the planet. And so we can't point to that and say, see, that's why. No, that's foolishness. Um, I believe that Haiti is just par for the course of people taking advantage of it. And I pray that Haiti would one day raise up some leaders um, that would really love its people and love its nation to the degree um, that it will start taking back some power and really start doing some positive things for it. So be praying for Haiti. Uh, be, be praying for that nation um, as it again tries to recover um, from another devastating blow. So be praying for Haiti, be praying for Afghanistan, um, and be praying for America. Be praying for this nation that we currently live in. Because there's a lot going on here, too. Um, 
<laughs> I say this with a grain of salt. I say it succinctly. Um, I say it with compassion. But I am so sick of COVID-19. I don't know what to do with myself. We now have another strand, the Delta variant. Variant. Um, there is now a push for mandatory vaccines. Mandatory vaccines. Mandatory vaccines. If you look at New York, Mayor de Blasio just enacted a law two weeks ago that requires you show your vaccination card before you enter a restaurant, a gym, and three other industries in New York. I, mandatory for a virus that has a 99.7% survival rate. That's according to the CDC. That's according to Dr. Fauci. I want you to think that if an AIDS patient had to show his vaccine card, his medication card, that he was taking medication for a detrimental disease called HIV and AIDS, the uproar that it would that would cause about making an AIDS patient show that he's taking medication for his virus or his disease. Mandatory. The State Department just came out last week and said that there will be a seven year federal sentence for those who are doctoring vaccination cards. Seven years. Seven. In 2021, in America, 35,000 people have died from COVID. In 2021, up until the day that this podcast is airing. 35,000. Look at it. Pull it up. Go to the CDC website. Look at the number of COVID patients that have died from COVID. And then I want you to look at the list below it and look at those numbers and the people that have died from cancer, from all of these other things that we're not fighting. You're mandating people to get a vaccine? Now, I will tell you for myself, I struggled with it greatly. I struggle with it greatly. Um, my wife and I did get the vaccine. My reason for getting it is because I travel extensively. I am not an anti-vaxxer. When I had to go to Africa some years ago, I had to have an, a vaccine for typhoid, for yellow fever, um, for a number of different things that are prevalent in the region that we from the West going to Africa had to inoculate ourselves to give us better protection when we got on the grounds over there. And so I, I am not an anti-vaxxer by no stretch of the imagination. Matter of fact, I believe in, in vaccinations. Um, it, it took some convincing for me uh, to get the vaccine, but I got it. Uh, me and my wife got the vaccine. We got it. I got it voluntarily. Not because somebody was mandating me getting it. We're living in an age right now to where we're saying discrimination is not tolerated. We're saying discrimination is not tolerated. I had a friend of mine who um, was in the hospital. His parents when his excuse me, his father was in the hospital and they made a decision as he was suffering in the later stages of his life for him to leave the hospital and come home and die and, and transition, excuse me, and transition at home around his family. He could have received further treatment 
uh, at the hospital, at that physical hospital with the doctors and nurses and all of the medicines. But as a family, they decided, along with his father, that because he was coming to an end of his life and he was getting ready to transition, that he wanted to do that in the comfort of his home. They made a choice to do that. And his father, um, by the way, was a born again believer, praise God. His father transitioned at home. He passed away at home. They had a choice. They had a choice. His father had a choice. The family had a choice by how that person would live the remainder of his life. He had a choice. Now, it was clear that he was dying. It, it was clear that he was dying. But they had a choice about how he wanted to live his life. He had a choice in that. Uh, please, please hear me. You get into very tricky grounds when you start talking about mandates. Forcibly mandating. It's well documented if you go around and you look at any particular news source, wherever you get it from, where people have lost their jobs because they refuse not to get they refuse to get the vaccine. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their livelihoods and their abilities to take care of their families because they had moral objections to the vaccine. They've lost their jobs. And now you're telling me that I have to pull out my card, which is a clear violation of my HIPAA rights, by the way. I got to pull out my card and say, look, let me show you that I've been vaccinated before I can enter into a restaurant, before I can go into a place of business. I have to show you that. Do you know how many people out here are walking around with stuff? Tuberculosis? Tuberculosis has increased in America 17% in the last year. You know how contagious uh, tuberculosis is? But yeah, we're not requiring a vaccine card for tuberculosis. And when we start talking about show me this, and, and again, the reason why this is important, the reason why this is important is, be, and, and let's look at the holy grail of who's talking about this. The CDC the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, says that COVID-19 has a 99.7% survival rate and that if you get it, you have a 99.9% .9 survival rate of building up the immunity and the antibodies to combat it. Now, now the Delta variant is now on the landscape. I am, um, I am <sighs> mandatory vaccines is not what you do. Everybody, uh, people do have a choice. Listen, you have a choice. Would I admonish you to be safe rather than sorry? Yes. Yes. I would advise you to wear a seatbelt than to not wear a seatbelt. Because in the event that you do get into an accident, there's a greater probability of you walking away from a crash with a seatbelt on than having a seatbelt off. Absolutely. But the mandatory vaccines of that I have to show you that I'm vaxxed in order for me to gain access into a capitalist nation it's, it's just too much, y'all. It's just too much. You, 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 you don't get to tell me that. And I think, and this is not a conspiracy theory, y'all. I think we forget about Tuskegee and all of the things in which we've talked about. This is not good that we are forcing this down the throats of Americans, of Americans. Uh, another one that you need to hear, according to the CDC, is that 71% of all Americans have been vaccinated. 71%. 71% of Americans have been vaccinated. 71. And yet, 
with the vaccination, I know this personally because I know somebody that has, with the vaccination, you can apparently now still get COVID-19. As I know somebody right now that has been fully vaccinated and still got it. 71% of all Americans have been vaccinated. I would encourage you um, to do your research. And if this is something for you and your family, I believe that is something that you should look into. Okay. Because there is this thing and, and, and with, with all of the now news coming out about COVID-19 and the Wuhan lab and, and this task force that has been relegated to investigate its origins. And if you haven't looked at that report, you need to look at it. Um, and, there's a lot about this stuff that that is deeply troubling, deeply troubling. But you can't mandate this, y'all. You you just you you just can't. It, it's literally against the law. It, it, I don't often agree with her, but uh, even Nancy Pelosi said last week. Uh, in a press conference, we cannot mandate American citizens to take the vaccine. It is against the Constitution. It is against the Constitution. You can't do it. So because it's against the Constitution, here's what we're doing. We're finding ways around the Constitution to say we're going to make life terribly difficult for you if you don't get it. So... There's a lot that's happening right now in our world. Um, and I believe, <laughs> I believe, um, I still believe that God is in control. I do. It's just a lot going on. There's a lot going on. What does God say about all of this? Um, in Matthew 16, he said that the gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, God says that it's going to look bad, but I got this. But he also says in the book of Ephesians that you need to arise, O sleeper. Rise up. You need to wake up. He says, arise, O sleeper, and Christ will give you light. Christ will give you light. So please be in a deep spirit of prayer, everybody. Listen, um, God is in control. God is good. God has equipped us. God has empowered us. Um, but at the same time, we hold a responsibility uh, in this. We hold a responsibility in this that we have to do our due diligence. We have to be alert. We have to be knowledgeable um, about certain things so that we can make the best decisions possible um, for us and for our um, children. So everybody, I want to thank you. Um, coming up this Thursday, we will be starting our Courageous Conversations. Courageous Conversations. Courageous Conversations will be happening this Thursday. Uh, we're going to be releasing. We do two studio uh, podcasts every single week. We will then be going to uh, three and four um, of these podcasts. And we will be doing a live show where I will be taking your questions uh, your comments. Listen, nothing is off limits. If you've got something that you want to add, if you've got a, if you disagree, man, I welcome you to come on and offer a different perspective. I will be taking your, your uh, questions and comments live online as we discuss these things live and in person. So be looking for courageous conversations to come to your YouTube here very, very shortly. And again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us here on the set of Studio B. Remember, be informed, be empowered, Studio B.